Hey everyone, welcome back to The Fin Factor. I'm Paul. And I'm Aaron. And this is episode number 40. 40. Mike Ratchie, oh, the yeah. old punching bag of the San Jose Sharks fans. And... Auntie Sumella. Yeah, unless yeah. we forget. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, this week we have a really good show for you. There was an article out about uh, 25 years at the tank, so we're going to be mentioning that. We're going to also bring up some stuff about the GM meeting that they had in Florida, mm -hmm. as well as maybe an example of a team that did a little too much of the trade deadline. So uh, we'll talk about Sharks depth. Uh, we'll talk about this last week in review mm -hmm. and uh, the upcoming games, as well as a new jersey on our set. Very good. You ready to start the show? Ready. Well, I am ready for one hail of a show. So for those of you who don't live in San Jose, uh, the reason for that open, obviously, it was it was hailing today in San Jose. So it was it was pretty crazy. I was at a uh, roller hockey tournament. Actually, I'm going to bring this up real quick. Uh, <laughs> my, my son uh, was playing at a six and under tournament for roller hockey at uh, Silver Creek Sportsplex, actually. And it was kind of just a hodgepodge team of kids that they threw together. And they were playing against this other team who's not lost in three seasons, apparently. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know, it's nuts. So, uh, well, because it's six and under, so you could be five years old and play. But anyway, so uh, they, they were up against this team and they had their best skater, would normally skate with them, but he's from the local rink, so we had him and they beat us uh, big time in the two games we played. But then the championship game, uh, we pulled off the win. So uh, my son's six and under uh, hockey team, who he's never played with before, <laughs> um, they just won. So I wanted to highlight that and show off his his medal that he got so um really cool so it's you know narch um regional qualifier so they can actually go and play in sonoma i think is next the next one so cool. uh gold one really good job so really proud of you but i know you're listening we got we got a lot of listeners of all uh, ages and um shape sizes and different <laughs> places that they listen from and my son is one of our biggest listeners he has me listen to it uh every day in the car so <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> it's pretty cool so anyway i know you're listening buddy good job really proud of you so moving on from that now there was that article that we were uh, uh alluding to at the, the top there the yep. 25 years at the tank so that was from nhl.com yeah um and I, I uh forgot who wrote it but uh local writer mm -hmm. I'm blanking on his name uh, anyway, there's some great stories in there of uh, the last 25 years at the arena. And the Sharks Arena is the fourth oldest arena, which is crazy to think because to me, I mean, I guess we're old. 92, mm -hmm. 93 doesn't seem like it was... No, we're old. Or 93, 94 was not that long ago. <laughs> like, I remember that season. Um, but, uh, yeah, there's some there's some great excerpts. There's, there's a great story that I like to highlight. Uh, it's Kevin Constantine. <laughs> so the coach of the Sharks at the time... Imagine uh, trying to tell your team, okay, boys, um, before we start tonight, I just want you to know that uh, when you skate out of the locker room, there's going to be this giant shark head that's going to come <laughs> down, and there's going to be fog, and you can't turn too tight left or right when you come out. You have to skate straight through and not hit anybody um, because it, it, you're not going to be able to see much. You don't want to hit the teeth. You're going to hit the teeth, yeah. but you, you're not going to be able to see because of the fog and right. the low lighting and everything. So just be careful out there. And the guy's like, uh, <laughs> okay, that's cool. And it ends up being, you know, it's one of the iconic things, oh, I yeah. think, of the arena. So um, at that point, no other team had ever skated out to anything like that before. So it was a very um, forward approach to uh, hockey, yeah. which was what the Sharks kind of were when they first started. So that was a pretty cool story. Um, and there's a lot more info in their stuff, but yeah, it was. Uh, and one of the things they pointed out was a lot of the loudest moments ever in the Shark Tank, and actually, um, one fairly recent one, uh, I think, was the number one was the Donskoys. Yeah. yeah. So Donskoys, uh, you know, game winner in the Stanley Cup Finals that he had. Um, that was. I mean, the tank was incredibly loud at that point. Um, the second one, actually, one of my favorites was the five on three. With two broken sticks, yeah. With uh, Mark Smith, let's and we see. We talked about this a long time <coughs> ago. I think in the summer of like our favorite standout moments, right? And yeah. that was definitely one of them for me. And it, it, it actually made the article, so mm -hmm. it must have been a really good one. So yeah, it was Mark Smith. I think uh, Kyle McLaren and Scott Hannon. I think McLaren was the only one that had his stick. Yeah. Everybody else, uh, I mean, two broken sticks yeah. on a five-on-three, which is nuts. And um, they couldn't score. <laughs> if you don't, if you don't have, if you've never seen that, you definitely need to check that out. And I'm sure we could put that in a little info button up there or something like that. So we'll you guys put it can, down below. Or either way, yeah. yeah. So, 
Um, that one was really cool. And then I think the third one was something about uh, Zuzin scoring. Yeah, right. scoring a goal. And, the, and say, say they blew the, the roof off of the SAP Center. And, or at that point, it was probably still. That's when uh, it was against Dallas. And they, yeah. the, they scored on Belfour, and everyone was chanting, Belfour. I, was, I think <laughs> I, I was at that game because yeah. I remember that a lot like just chanting that and hating on Belfort and then they said in the article that there was a, a, a news headline it was probably in the Mercury News <laughs> that was suddenly Susan like suddenly Susan yeah, for, yeah. cute um, in any case so yeah that was really cool what was, what was the other thing on, on that uh, article you wanted to uh, just the villains oh going, yeah going back to Belfort uh, the top villains of, of Sharks fans hating right. on so it was Belfort Pronger and Flurry. oh yeah and well, Theo Flurry for a long Theo, time yeah. in the beginning <laughs> He used to just terrorize the Sharks. He scored so many goals and was all over the ice and yeah. just one of those pesky players. Um, so he got booed a lot in the early days and deservingly so because he destroyed the Sharks all the time. Um, yeah. And then Pronger, I mean, if you're a newer Sharks fan, you don't know who Chris Pronger is, but another thorn on the side when he played on St. Louis and Edmonton and Anaheim, um, just constantly yeah. just working over the Sharks. And he <laughs> loved the boos because, you know, you thrive on it as a player. Yeah. And then Belfour, because he moved from the Sharks. He got traded to the Sharks and then said he wanted to stay and then didn't. He went to Dallas and said he wanted to win a cup. Yeah. He wanted to sign with a team that uh, had a chance at winning the cup. And it was so a then, slap in the face. Yeah, the everybody fans. hated him right after that. Yeah, so. yeah he signed really for so. less money, too, in Dallas. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Oh, geez. Yeah. So that's an even bigger slap, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, moving on from that, there was uh, also some GM meetings that happened in Florida. And I know there was some points about it that we wanted to raise, some things that we thought maybe actually we would come up with our own little points of things that we would like to see as far as changes to the NHL, but things that they had actually talked about, if you wanted to go over those. Right. Uh, one of them is putting clocks in the corners of the boards for the mm -hmm. players to see. Um, they already do this for outdoor games, so it's most of the players that have played them will know what it was or what it's like. It's not a big problem. I don't see it. The only thing is is figuring out how to you know change the advertisements. But if you look at tennis, tennis was it Psycho? Is that Seiko? Is the, the oh clock? S E I K O? I think Seiko. Yeah. I think is I don't think it's it. pronounced Psycho. I think right. they would have thought that Sorry. one out. Yeah, <laughs> uh, Seiko has a big. <laughs> Clock uh, right. advertising around the clock, so I don't think it's gonna be a problem finding an advertiser for a clock. That's fair. In the NHL, IMAX or somebody, yeah. right? Somebody, <laughs> right? So um, I think that's a no-brainer. Why mm -hmm. wouldn't you do that? And then um, the other thing is uh, changing the row in the standings, the regulation or overtime wins. Um, some GNs want just regulation wins because overtime wins are not exactly the same as a regulation win. I think you should you should. Um, reward mm -hmm. the teams that get regulation wins and not just overtime or yeah, yeah. well they already got rid of the shootout wins rewarding them for that mm. so um i'm all for that i have no problems with it um an overtime win is to me is not the same because it's three on three now i mean you can't if you look at, a, at two teams in the playoffs and they're playing each other one team was six and oh in overtime and one team was oh and four in overtime in the regular season who's going to win the game it's completely different right. in the playoffs, so I don't think uh, that should matter. No, that's a good point. Yeah. Right. So um, looking at that, changes that we would make, um, I don't know. They, we we kind of went through and we saw some little points that they had made, and we were thinking, like, well, what would we do, right, if, if it was uh, up to us or we were right. part of the GM meeting? We actually had some questions from the live as well mm -hmm. saying, hey, what would you guys do or what do you think changes would be made? One of the things that I brought up that no, people didn't really like, I don't even think he, he liked it, to no, be honest. I don't. Um, which is fine, <laughs> but here, here's, here's I'll, I'll tell you what it is and I'll tell you my reasoning behind it. I was saying to shrink the offensive zone a little bit, basically pull the blue line uh, away from the red line, right? Pull them closer towards the net. And I know that the inclination is to think, well, that means that there's less room in the offensive zone, so they're not going to be able to work as well, right? You want to have more room in the offensive zone so you have a better chance of passing the puck around and getting your chances. You have to look beyond the puck possession there and realize that if the blue line gets pulled in closer to the goal, that means the defensemen who are on the offensive side have to pull in closer to the goal as well. They can't defend as well against a rush or a transition attack. And I think that opens up to having more scoring chances. So um, I, that's just the way I see it. And I think it's a it's a change that could help in terms of we're trying to get more scoring. I think that's one way of doing it and I rewarding teams that are fast and good on the transition game. I think yes and no. I think uh, shrinking, shrinking the offensive zone basically for those transitions, mm -hmm. yes. But then when there's possession in the zone, there's less room to work around and there's more... There's less space to work around, so the defenders are going to be able to defend it easier, getting right. sticks in more lanes 
and then transitioning going back the other way. Right. So I think there will be less time in the offensive zone, which would lead to less goals. That's my argument. Potentially. But so leave us in the comments what you think. Yeah, actually, that's right? a great idea. So yeah. um, after you hear all of these, tell us right. which ones you like, and then go ahead and say which ones that you would do. So um, right. there was another one you wanted to bring up, though. I think what would be really interesting and, and different is um, if you have a minor penalty and you score a shorthanded goal, your guy gets out of the box. <laughs> I think that would be... Awesome. Now, I wouldn't do it for major penalties. Right. Just like major penalties, you have to serve the full time for mm -hmm. you, however many power play goals they score against you. Uh, but I think you'd see a little uptick in scoring because, for one, teams are going to try and go for a shorthanded goal. And if they don't and they don't get it, yeah. now they can transition back the other way. It'll just open up things a little bit more, Sure, I think. And then if you're down a goal or two in the game late and you really push for that extra goal shorthanded, you know, they do that anyway. But yeah. then it would make it a lot more interesting. Now, maybe you changed it to just certain infractions that you do that. So, like, the non-violent ones. Like, no <laughs> high sticking, no right. no anything like that. Roughing. Right. right. So, um, it would be something to tool around with, but I think it would be pretty cool. Nice. Yeah, so uh, that sounds like a pretty good one. I, I also like, and I think they were actually thinking of doing this, but maybe it just hasn't made the cut yet. You know, I mean, we've seen many times where, you know, a guy goes in across the blue line and he's got his foot just barely off the ice. Uh, it's still behind the blue line, but it's just off the ice and they call it for offsides. I would rather see that, you know, it, just as long as the skate is behind the blue line. I don't care if it's up in the air, if it's down the ice, if it's anywhere else, as long as it's behind the blue line. So let's not call offsides for, you know, a, a body part basically being on the correct side of the line, mm -hmm. regardless of whether or not it's touching the ice. That's one change I think would be um, a, a welcome change because too many times where, you know, somebody picks up the, their, their skate just as the yeah. puck crosses and it's like, would it really have made a difference? Would they really have not scored because I think it, they did that? Like, I also think that simplifies it. It, yeah. it takes less time to review, right? Was the skate on the ice or was it just like over the line yeah. at some point, right? I think that's easier to review because now they have those cameras that are right on the blue right. line, so it's a lot easier to, to tell and see on replay. Um, and speaking of replay, they uh, we were talking about one minute challenges, right? Oh For yeah, replay. yeah. So that's that's the other one that I had. And I guess we'll skip over it. So yeah, um, I was thinking for one minute. Is the, is the time limit for the referees to try to get a call right? So if they say it's a goal, and they say it's challenged by you know X Y Z, right? Um, you now have essentially a time limit, a one minute time limit. If you can't figure out if you need to overturn it or not within a one minute time limit, it's too close to call, and it really wouldn't have mattered one way or the other. That's the way I see it. So mm -hmm. um, it, it helps them be a little more clear cut and defined and streamlined on determining things like goaltender interference. Mm -hmm. You know, it either is or it isn't. If you're trying to like really see, it's probably whatever you call on the ice and just let that stand. So for basically giving them one minute to decide and if they can't figure it out, call on the ice stands. That's them and, and Toronto. And to, well, combined. Yeah, yeah, sure, right? sure, yeah. I think more replays. Basically, once they get on the phone and they're looking right. at the iPad, and all, you have one minute. Get it done or move on to it. Yeah. Because it's not going to make that big of a difference. If you're looking at, like, you know, millimeters and microseconds, it wouldn't have made that big of I mean, a difference. I think, so. and I, I don't know if they're going to change this because the Sharks kind of, you know, Boston's goal to tie it up late in the game is yeah. so controversial. I don't know if they're going to change or try to change the over or um, reviewable stuff. But I think... Um, Almost like the football, NFL, every scoring play should be reviewable. They should be able to go back and go, did anything kind of shady happen? Do we need to call us back? Do we need to get it right? But also at the same time, how much human error do we really need to eliminate right. and try and get everything perfect? They're not robots. So um, there's always going to be things that are going to come up. So I don't know if it makes it better because then you're wasting time. But going back to your one minute thing, yeah. I think, I mean, if Toronto's constantly watching the games and knowing, oh, that looked like a high stick, they should have called that. And then right away, if a team challenges or Toronto hits the button and says, you know, buzzes yeah. and says, hey, uh, you need to look at this, then I think they should be able to do that, which yeah. they can't right now. Right. Um, the other thing I was going to do yeah. is three-point games. Mm -hmm. We've talked about this before, but um, coming from a soccer background, I'm used to the three points in the standings. It's not that big of a deal. I can do math, so I don't mind. <laughs> uh, three points meaning... Every NHL game has three points up for grabs. You win in over or you win in regulation, you get full three points. You win if you go to overtime. Now whoever gets the shootout or the overtime win gets two, and the other team gets one. That eliminates the whole standings, and it'll really show the teams that are strong in regulation are going to jump ahead quicker. 
and the teams that are getting those overtime or whatever. And then when you're chasing teams towards the end, like we're, we're seeing, thankfully the Sharks aren't doing this, but yeah. having to wait for the other team to lose or they're playing two other teams in your division and they go to overtime, now they both get points and jump in the standings. Yeah. I don't think it's fair. I think this has been a problem since they updated the the scoring, I guess, or the, the standings scoring. So um, to me that makes the most sense. I don't know if they'll ever do it. Yeah. But I, I just I would like to see that implemented. Yeah, and for any of these, I mean, we'll see how many of them actually make the cut for next season, and uh, how many of them kind of get put on the docket for, you know, maybe getting looked at at a later date. Mm. Um, moving on from that, at least, we're going to be talking a little bit about a team that maybe did a little too much at the trade deadline. So um, Columbus, <laughs> <laughs> this so they they have on Artemi Panarin, they have uh, Sergei Bobrovsky, and they're both going to be UFAs at the end of the season. And they both pretty much have said they don't want to come back. And they both have said they don't want to come back. So now you've got these two assets who you're just, they're a lock to get moved, right? You're, they're absolutely going to get moved. And what does Columbus do? They go out and get guys. They double down. Yeah. <laughs> and it they did. And yeah. it's, it's fantastic, I think. I, I think, uh, why not? You know, If you're a season ticket holder in Columbus, you know, all two of them, <laughs> so are they going to, are they going to, um, are you going to be happy? That those, you know those two guys don't want to be there. You're in a playoff spot. What do you do? Yeah. You're in a no-win situation, I think, as the GM. Yeah. So you go out and get these guys, and you go, wow, my GM is actually trying to do something. Like mm-hmm. they're, they're trying to make it work. So that makes me more interested as a fan, a Columbus fan. So That's I think fair. it's better to go that way than to just sell and give up. Okay. I look at, at the San Jose Sharks, and I look at the fans who have been saying, you know, is this all we're going to get at the trade deadline? <laughs> When we picked up Haley, right? Fans going, is this is this the big splash that we're gonna make? Oh, we got Nyquist. Yeah, but that was my point. Was that everybody got all upset and up in arms, and it's like, well, just just calm down. First of all, did you forget? Did you forget about EK sixty five? Because that was an acquisition. That's not a trade deadline acquisition. That was an acquisition for this season, though. It's how quickly we forget that we just pick somebody up who's new to the team who doesn't feel new anymore, right? Imagine if we made that trade at the deadline. Oh yeah. Instead of in the summertime. So we had Chris Tierney, we had DeMello, we had, who was the other one? Uh, Balsers. Balsers, yeah. who's probably going to be in the minors anyway. Sure. Um, and trade him for EK65, and he comes in a week ago, two weeks ago. Yeah. Um, I don't I don't know how the fan base, I mean, they would probably be like, yay, we're going to win the yeah. cup. Yeah. You know, because we made the biggest trade, and everybody in the league is talking about us right now. But that's the I thing. think that's it. So we, we make that splash in the right. beginning of the season. Right, and so everybody gets all up in arms that maybe something's not happening during the trade deadline, and it, all, all our big acquisition was Haley. Right, okay. Then after the fact, yes, we go out and we grab Nyquist, and we got. We, I mean, that just shows how much uh, Doug Wilson really wants to to go all in on this win, right? You know, uh, on this up opportunity to right. get a cup here. So um, I just I look at it and I kind of go, you know, just the fan base guys, calm down. It's okay. <laughs> We're gonna be okay. Like. We've been um, saying that all season. I, I know, <laughs> and it's like, I don't know how many more times you need to say it. Right. But, um, you know, we look at, at our, our depth, really, and I, I don't know if that's where we're going next year. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, okay, yeah. so looking at our depth. Oh, um, wait, 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 hold on. Oh, sorry. Let's go back to Columbus real okay, quick. Okay, we'll go to Columbus again. Our yeah. whole point in Columbus yeah. is they went out and made a big splash, right? right? Huge splash. They got, uh, who they got? Duchesne, Dezingle, McQuaid, and Kincaid. Right. They got two forwards, a defenseman, and a goalie. Why did they get another goalie? Who knows? <laughs> it's really bizarre the moves. Some, some of the moves, in yeah. There. Um, and they are three and four in their last seven games. <laughs> They're not lighting the things on fire. They're not destroying teams. And yeah. a lot of it has to do what we've talked about is chemistry, right? Mm-hmm. They don't have the chemistry that you're bringing a lot of new guys onto your team. Um, I, I just don't. You know, Columbus might make playoffs. They might even might. They might not make playoffs. Who knows? And if they don't, that's a disaster. It that, really is. It could blow up in their face. Because look at all the things that they gave away. They gave away a pair of seconds for, right. I think it was Dezingle. Yeah. They, I mean, they traded some of their prospects away. They gave away some more of their picks. A uh, former Sharks prospect. <clears throat> Bergman, yeah. right? Um, I mean, a fourth and a seventh, I think, is what they gave up for, uh, what was it, McQuaid? Yeah. Uh, so maybe not, you know, and high Bergman. quality. high yeah. quality, And Bergman. High, not, maybe not high quality picks. But, I mean, you've seen what the Sharks are able to do with these late-round picks, and they turn it into something. And you've got, you know, a pair of seconds, a fourth, a seventh, uh, you know, a prospect in Bergman. You, you're giving up a whole lot of stuff to then go back and say, okay, we've only got three wins and four losses. And part of the reason is, yeah, you've got some big names, but you don't have the chemistry. But even if they make playoffs, I just don't what are they see gonna them do? going far. Yeah, I, Maybe out of the first round, but that's, I don't see, they don't look like a cup-winning team yeah. to me. I don't know. 
So, uh, you know, everybody who wants to have that big name and that big make that big splash, it's it's nice, but a lot of I think want that the NHL, you know, <laughs> winning the trade deadline basically yes, yeah. and being all over the news and everyone saying how great Doug Wilson is and all right. that stuff. That's I think what a lot of people are upset about or and want. I, and I think it was the smarter move. Uh, you had said, you know, what if we bought brought Carlson in at this point, right? Yeah. At the trade deadline or prior to actually cuz the trade deadline has passed. But what if you brought him in at the trade deadline? I don't well, think he gels. I mean, the first ten games he had a hard say, time look at playing the first, with Vlasic. Put those first twenty games in the season, right? And put them at the ed- end of the season, right? It'd be a disaster. Yeah. So, so I don't know. I, I think we did the right thing on that one, and I think Columbus is they're in for a shock because yeah. uh, they're going to lose those players that don't want to be there in the first place. The players that they acquired are going to be UFA as well, and they probably are not going to want to play there because they're. I just don't think they're going to want to play there. Right. I mean, you, you're losing it's an elite Columbus. quality goaltender in, in Bobrovsky. You're playing in Ohio, which is not much fun, and you're not going to be playing with Artemi Panarin, who's one of the best talents in the league either because he's going to want to get out too. Mm-hmm. So... I, I don't know. I think it, Columbus might be the next dumpster fire in the <laughs> NHL. Hopefully not. We hope that they're uh, you know they they rebuild well and everything. But I just don't see it happening. It's it's kind of like how Ottawa gave away their first into Colorado, right. and now they could really use that first. Yep. So yeah, it's it's just a shame. But moving on, we wanted to talk about the um, the Sharks' depth. Yep. And um, one of the things I wanted to bring up was how in, during the live. We were talking about, well, where's Donskoy going to go? <laughs> and we are saying, oh, well, I mean, this is, again, one of these great problems to have. Once Evander Kane gets back into the lineup, yeah, Donskoy might have to get pushed down to, you know, that low utilization line. But <laughs> think of it this way. We have him playing up in the top nine, somewhere in the top nine, because Evander Kane is hurt. I mean, that's that shows the depth that we have if when one of our guys comes back. I think same with Sorensen. I think yeah. he was kind of starting the season off possibly as like more of a fourth-line right. guy, and he's been playing really well with Thornton mm-hmm. on the third line, well. the so-called third line. <laughs> so um, now Donskoy is kind of, you know, replaceable. Yeah. I don't know what you call him, but he there's so much depth that he can get bumped down to the fourth line. I'll, the I'll, line. I'll say this. Donskoy right now is extra i'll say that we have we have more than what we need we have an abundance of talent so much so that we have to talk about putting somebody right on that fourth line right i mean it's crazy you have you have uh kane and (laughs) carlson (laughs) coming back into the lineup Uh, yeah kane and carlson are coming back in the lineup so that means Haley's going to come out Mm -hmm. most likely and heed heed right you're replacing heed and Haley with kane and Carlson. That's insane. So you're replacing, let's put it in perspective, you're replacing a seventh defenseman and a fourth line more enforcer type role player with a a elite Norris Trophy, <laughs> two-time Norris Trophy winning uh, defenseman. And it's not like you're plugging in another seventh, right. is my point. Right. You're plugging in probably the first or second best defenseman on the team at when you drop the seventh defenseman out, right, right, you're you're replacing a guy who's essentially like more of like the the heavy boxer type, with a guy who essentially kind of can do the same thing, but is also has got incredible speed, yeah, amazing skill. scoring touch, right. Uh, uh, I mean, he's one of the better talents in the league and on this team in Evander Kane, and you're going to replace him with Michael Haley. Now, no disrespect to Michael Haley, you have a role on the team, but. I mean, we're, we're talking about night and day in terms of the amount of skill that you're injecting into the lineup. Again, you're not plugging another fourth liner in there or an Antti Suomela, a guy who's maybe a little bit younger, a Dylan Gambrell. You're not plugging one of those guys in. You're plugging in a guy who knows what he's doing, has played in the league for a long time, and can score big time. Yep. So that's the type of depth that we have right now, even without Evander Kane, even without I Eric mean, Carlson. Look at this week. Right, those two guys are out, and a couple guys, Burns mm-hmm. and I think Pavelski, had the flu, and yeah. they missed a couple <laughs> days, a couple practices. Right, um, and to most teams, having all four of those guys out, right, devastating, would be, be a disaster. Yeah, and luckily, Pavelski and Burns both played, but um, just missing Kane and, and Carlson on another team, right, that would that would probably spell doom for those two games, and they would they would be losses, and the Sharks won both. 
Well, the Sharks are winning lots of games, and uh, largely in part to one man who's uh, putting up tons of goals. He didn't get one this week, but we forgot to mention it last week. It is the Pavelski Goal Watch. <laughs> <laughs> so he's up to with 36, 36 goals. 36 goals. Uh, again, he didn't get one this week, so uh, nothing to report there, but we did forget. So we wanted to stay consistent and put it back up there. So, yeah, up to 36. What do you think are his chances now? We, we talked a little about this in the live, but... Yep. Um, I I could see him getting so his what was his forty one was his career uh, goals. Mm -hmm. um, I bet he beats that. that. Let's make that the over. Okay, forty one. Yeah, I think he goes over. I think he gets to about between forty two and forty five goals. Yeah, I, I'm I'm in agreement with you there. I think forty is definitely a lock for me. Um, forty one, his career high is only one goal away from that, and I think he's gonna punch a couple more of them in. Um, I just I just got that feeling. Now fifty is probably out of reach at this point. We've got what 15, 14 games, something like yeah. that left. So um, that one's probably out of reach, but I, I think we're definitely, because that's essentially a goal of game. Right. Right. So um, if he's on that pace going to the playoffs, <laughs> I'm feeling real good. Yeah. But uh, I, I mean, he saves that for the playoffs. Yeah. <laughs> but I think more realistically, yeah, I think he's going to beat his uh, his record there or his his career his high. Career high, yeah. And uh, it'll probably be in the 42, 43, somewhere range. So probably not by a whole ton, but I think he'll, he'll eclipse that. Mm -hmm. So let's jump into the games that we did see this week. I uh, believe the first one was against Montreal. That was a really good game. Montreal. Uh, they are a very small but fast team, and I think they played a lot better than I thought they would. Mm -hmm. Not that I think they're terrible, but I didn't think they were a top caliber team like they seemed to be playing that night. Um, luckily for the Sharks, that's one of the very few times the Sharks get outshot in a mm -hmm. game. I think their average was like 27 shots, goals against, and uh, they had that by the second period. Uh, so they ended up with 39 shots mm -hmm. against Jones, right. and Jones did pretty well, right? Yeah, Jones did great. I mean, uh, we were looking at it. I think he only had... We only gave up two goals. Yeah, it was only two goals against, and they were both high danger, and that's something that we're going to bring up uh, in the St. Louis game as well. Yeah. Uh, but, I mean, Jones played a, a phenomenal game. He made every low and medium danger save. He, he There was two of them that went in that were high danger, and one of those was some goofy ricochet bounce. Yeah. It went off of... I think it went off of Vlasic, right? I think it went or off of Pavelski's skate, if oh. I recall, and then off of whoever was in front of the net, and it went in. And it's one of those ones where, you know, he's in position, and all of a sudden it goes like, dink, dink, and it just... Yeah, but bounces around. He, he, I mean, that's considered high danger because it was so close and it went in. But right. really, realistically, it's it was just a lucky crazy goal. ricochet, yeah. totally lucky bounce. So, um, I mean, yeah, I don't know. I I don't really fault him for stuff like that. And I, I've talked about before where I defend Jones maybe more than the fan base would like me to. But <laughs> uh, I I just I can't I can't ignore the fact that the majority of the shots that he's seeing, or a lot of the shots he's seeing, I should say majority, but a lot of the shots he's seeing on a nightly basis are high danger, and I don't mm. put that on him. I put that on the people that are allowing those high danger chances to come through. So, I don't know. I just have a real rough time saying Jones is the problem. Jones is the problem. I know his stats. I know he's got a really bad goals against average. I know he's got really bad save percentage, but I think those numbers, again, as I've said many times, are indicative of of the people playing in front of him allowing those high danger chances to come through and at least in these two games which we'll get to St. Louis in a second he shut all those ones down apart from the high danger stuff right so I think he's been playing better I think he's, his game which we've been saying we're expecting yeah. um, getting down the stretch here and the Sharks are winning I mean to me the most important is the win column yeah. and he is winning he's I don't know as of now probably second or third still yeah. in the league for wins um, you need 16 in the playoffs. Yep. And if he's winning, I'm fine with it. Sharks, I mean, yeah, they've been outscoring their problems, but um, I think lately they've been getting better. So they only let two goals against in mm -hmm. both games right. this week. Um, and that's, again, without Carlson and Kane. Um, but they're but playing better. They're possession they're guys, yeah. those two, right? So it's not so much that they're going to keep do a better job in the defensive zone, but they're going to possess the puck more. And those 39 shots maybe gets limited down closer to like 30, right? Because, yeah. again, they're going to be possessing the puck much more often. Now, Montreal, you said they were a smaller team. They did feel like they were running us around quite a bit. I mean, obviously 39 shots, so they were all over us. Uh, the St. Louis game, a little bit different. Not so much a smaller team, right? Right. They're a lot <laughs> bigger team. Yeah. They're more of a typical uh, West Coast team, I guess, mm -hmm. or West Conference team. Uh, big bodies, big skill, um, hitting hard. And um, the Sharks, like, it, it felt like a playoff game to me. It was, it was, man, the last two minutes of regulation, I was on the edge of my seat 
watching yeah. that. Like very excited. And then overtime obviously was incredible. Uh, <laughs> so it, they won three to two in overtime with LeBanc scoring a beauty. Yeah. Uh, from a feed from Couture. Yeah. So that was actually his two hundredth game, which is crazy because I'm like, wow, he it, plays two. He's already played two hundred yeah. games. I that's, that stat blew me away. I wasn't yeah. I wasn't prepared for that, right? right? But I mean, the goal was phenomenal. First of all, let's go back and I mean the the two goals by Timo right, right in the slot again, high danger, and those two went in. And these high danger chances, they tend to be the ones that go in. So um, yeah, I mean T- Timo did a great job. We thought he was going to get the hat trick for a while there because he had a couple other good chances. One mm-hmm. was like right in the slot again. Well, I think Jake Allen played incredible. Yeah, and he has not been playing that well this year. Mm-hmm. So. I thought it was going to be another one of those games where, like, oh, great, the Sharks are playing a goalie who's not having a good year and he's looking like a Vezina Trophy <laughs> winning goalie again. Yeah. But uh, the Sharks got the better of him yeah. finally. So it was 2-2, uh, two to two and we go into overtime. And there was a nice feed. Now, there was something that you noticed and I noticed yeah. about overtime. Go ahead, and, and I'll let you have that. Uh, <laughs> when, let's see, who was transitioning it? It was Hurdle. Had Hurdle. Passed it up. Hurdle passed it to Couture. Mm-hmm. And Couture and LeBanc were on the break. So kinda. what what do you guys recognize about those three names? Hurdle, Couture, LeBanc for a three-on-three. Three. There's no defenseman there. Nope. <laughs> Interesting. I wonder if this is something that and they're... And Hurdle was coming off, and who was coming on? And the guy coming on was Jumbo. Yeah, so it wasn't another defenseman. Yeah. So uh, it's interesting seeing that they're saying, okay, let's just go all-out offense. And, I mean, Brent Burns, you would think he's all-out right. offense too, but like, I'm just saying it, they had all offense, offensemen, right? I'm kind of surprised Forwards. that more teams haven't even tried this in, yeah. in the league just to get that extra point, right? Colorado specifically, right? You've right. got that line that's been so hot for a three-on-three. You would think just go ahead and throw them out there. I mean, what's the worst that happens, mm-hmm. you know? So, um, yeah, I mean, it, I think it, I just thought it was interesting that there was three fours out there because I guess they're just, you know, hey, let's just possess the puck and, and deal with it. Right. So Hurdle makes the pass up to Couture. Couture makes a beautiful pass, nice little sauce pass mm-hmm. over to LeBanc. And it's funny, if, if maybe we could throw a graphic up, um, there was a shot of LeBanc taking that one-timer, and my goodness, how low he got to the ground. I don't know yeah. if you saw that. I mean, the guy's squatting down pretty low. He's got his leg fully extended behind him, his sticks fully extended in front. He looked like a like a little short capital T. Yeah, like he was just really stretched out. And it was just LeBanc's amazing. known for his shooting, which he mm-hmm. hasn't done a whole lot of scoring goals this season. He's starting to now. He's really right. picking it up. But earlier in the season, we saw him more as a playmaker than yeah. than uh, a goal scorer. But now we're seeing the whole package and. Credit to him after the All-Star break. He's really performed well yeah. and has played well. And I think DeBoer is kind of, kind of telling him, like, it's now or never. Yeah. And he's delivered, yeah. thankfully. So hopefully he can continue this into the playoffs because he's on the top power play unit. He's trusted, his, yeah. his offense is not the problem. It's everything else right. behind it that leads to the offense. And so far he's been playing great. So I think he's been probably one of the Sharks' MVP in the last, I'd say, three weeks. Yeah, I mean, and DeBoer used the word elite. Mm-hmm. On the power play, that the LeBanc has been elite on the power play, and I think you know you take a look at his numbers, and it's hard to argue that specifically on the power play. Yep. Um, a lot of people didn't like that he's he's always doing that little bounce pass off the boards. And it's like what you don't understand is if you go to the practices, that's their set play. Essentially, they always start off with the puck on the boards. He'll uh, to, to start the play. He'll pass it to Pavelski, who's more towards the middle, and then Pavelski hits it back to him. He skates in a little bit off the boards, back to Burns. It's it's like you know clockwork. They they do that all the time. So uh, to get upset with him doing that during the game, that's just part of what they do in the practice. So um, yeah, I, I mean, again, elite on the power play. The guy's been hot recently. Even had a hat trick, you know, not that long ago. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I just hope to see that continue on through, uh, you know, obviously the end of the regular season and into the postseason. I so. mean, he's on that jumbo line with Sorensen right now. It's and that hard. Was, I yeah. think the last two games, <laughs> the, that line specifically, yeah. was on fire. And I think this is a segue into the playoffs of why the Sharks are going to do so well in the playoffs yeah. because of this mismatch of this jumbo line. And jumbo has been looking great. His legs are back under him. He's We've seen a couple back checks yeah. recently where he's come out of nowhere. Um, so he's looking good. He's looking like his normal Jumbo self from <laughs> three seasons ago before yeah. he had any knee injuries. Um, so it looks like those injuries are behind him. He's focused, and he is great. And as far as Jones is concerned, again, if I look at just the last couple of games, like I said we were going to, um, the only goals that were scored against him in those two were in the high danger variety. So everything low danger and medium danger, and he got same. 100% of them. And two of the goals that you, you saw too, two of the goals that were St. against Louis. the St. Louis team, 
both the, on the power play. Both power play goals. Mm -hmm. So in terms of even strength, I mean, he shut everything down in that game. Yeah. So I think, you know, there's a lot of, of hate going to Jones, and I can understand how you get, might get upset about the numbers, but let's take a look at what he's done for us lately, and at least in the last couple games, he's been pretty much lights out. He's yeah. played really, really well. Again, two power play goals against in that one game. The other game was the one weird ricochet, and the other only other one that he let in was, again, another high danger chance. Mm -hmm. Everything else that was low and medium danger, it, he kept it out of the net. Yeah. So... That's looking at what happened. We're going to look now at what's to come. We have four games this week. Yeah, another back-to-back. -back. I thought we were done with back-to-backs. Uh, not done, but I think this might be one of the last okay. ones. Okay. Uh, Keep we hearing that. <laughs> we have tomorrow <laughs> right. for us, but today for you guys Good. is uh, Minnesota, in Minnesota. And then following the next day and Tuesday is going to be Winnipeg. So that's going to be a tough back-to-back. -back. Unfortunately, yeah. it's not the other way around. Right. That would be nicer. Um, but for goalies, I would see, I would expect to see Dell against Minnesota, and Jones against Winnipeg. Um, yeah. I don't know, you're probably the same boat. I, I mean, we, and we talked about this in the live, yeah. and I, I would agree with you on that one. I would say it would make more sense to play it that way. Um, it, I, again, like you said, it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate that Winnipeg is the second part of that because you'd rather take the team that you know was selling off assets at the trade deadline right. and just happens to be in a playoff spot right now uh, as opposed to the team that bolstered up, right? Um, but, you know, it is what it is. There are no easy games. Everybody in the league is, is so good, and the parity in the league is so strong that it's really not going to matter. Um, we, we've we've beaten Winnipeg in the past, and we've lost to Minnesota in the past, so yeah. who's and to Winni say that's not going to happen again? Winnipeg's been struggling a little bit, too. Mm -hmm. uh, they were tops in the West Western Conference right. uh, in the Central Division, and now they're, now they're not. Now the Sharks are yeah. as of today. But... Um, so it's still a tough game, though. I think Buffalo always gives them problems. Mm -hmm. um, they have a lot of talent up front. Shifley is an amazing player. Mm -hmm. um, and Patrick Laine is kind of the, the story, I think, Winnipeg of their failure. Mm -hmm. uh, he's had a really bad season this year. He's a goal scorer who's not scoring goals. And that's, that's no a problem. Good. Yeah. Right. So um, I think Winnipeg is not as strong as people thought, including myself, going into the season. Um, their goaltending has been good, but not great, and um, we'll see. We'll see how that game plays out. Uh, but then Thursday they follow up, and they'll be home against Florida, and maybe we see Dell play in that game. Yeah, we give Jones a little bit more of a break mm -hmm. because Saturday is going to be against uh, Nashville, which is always a fantastic <laughs> game. The, I think the Nashville games are always just entertaining mm -hmm. uh the sharks always play well against nashville for whatever reason they've had their number going back to whenever nashville's made playoffs and the sharks beat them i just nashville fans must hate san jose <laughs> absolutely hate us because we always seem to beat them when it matters you know and there's one thing i will say about the nashville fans I've, i went to a game where it, we did have we were playing against nashville at the tank and there was some Nashville fans that were in front of us. I was in row two, amazingly, and they were in row one. Wow! And uh, they were—I know <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, but th so they were actually really, really cool, really nice, and everything. And um, so maybe were they the from rest Nashville? Of, yes, they, yeah. I think they were. They traveled down, so they were actually very, very nice and whatnot. And I, I think after the game, we uh, we were cheering. They were not. And as soon as, as soon as I was done screaming, my head off, I turned to them, I put my hand out, and I said, "Hey, man, great game." And just immediately says, up, shake my hand, hey, great game, you know, back. So, um, you know, I don't know if all of them hate us. I think maybe it, uh, <laughs> maybe they did hate hate us, or me specifically, I don't know. But he was certainly nice to my face. So right. probably as soon as I uh, got behind his back there, he was not too happy with me. Grumble, but, grumble. Grumble, grumble, <laughs> yeah. In any case, uh, yeah, I would love to uh, put a dent in their, uh, their little parade there if they're mm -hmm. doing fairly well this season. And that's so. two top teams in the Central. That's going to be rough, right? Yeah. In the same week. So we got a team that's uh, looked like they wanted to do a rebuild and they have a playoff spot. And we've got two other really tough teams and one team maybe not so hot. So what are you looking for in terms of points coming out of this trip or this week? Let's see. Um, I would love to see a win in Winnipeg. I think that would be fantastic. I think the win in Minnesota, we should win that game. Who knows? Maybe they'll play Staylock in that game against his former team. That'd be great. Um, and he's been doing pretty good this year, yeah. so who knows? Um, road games are always tough. Uh, Minnesota's always a tough place to play in. So is Winnipeg. Um, so I'd love to see two points at least out of those two games. Okay. Um, and then coming home against Florida, obviously we should just kill them. Uh, Luongo <laughs> tends to play well against the Sharks, I think. Okay. Um, 
but we'll see. We also get under skin. And <laughs> by the way, he has the best Twitter account. Oh yeah, of all the players, active players. Let's should we put yeah Strombone? Put it down I think yeah Strombone yeah. one. I think yeah. yeah. Uh, he's fantastic. <laughs> and then um, Nashville, I'd love to see them get beat. So I'd say six out of eight points, I'd be happy. Yeah, I'm thinking if, if we we're in the four, if we got fifty percent of the points, I'd be happy. Um, but I really think we can grab at least six of those points. So that's what I'd be looking forward to for uh, for this week. Mm-hmm. So uh, let us know what you think in the comments down below, how we're going to do this week. And uh, any of the other things we talked about, the other topics, uh, specifically the stuff about the GM rules. Right. Let us know if there's something that you think would be great or if you hate one of ours and <laughs> or like one of ours or whatever. So uh, I think there was one more One last thing, thing I wanted to yeah. do is highlight the jersey this week. And this comes from oh, San Jose Jersey Collectors. Yes. Uh, and we'll put that down in his yeah. Instagram account. Um, this is a Michael Swift jersey, number 16. It's game worn and signed. Turn that around, you can see it. And uh, it's the Reebok fifth year anniversary Worcester jersey. And this is also the hardest jersey for him to find. It took him uh, two and a half years wow. to track this, this bad boy down. So uh, it's awesome. So I was lucky enough to go to a Worcester game nice. uh, a couple years ago before they obviously came to be, become the Barracuda. Um, got to go see him out there. It was That was the year they had like nothing but third and fourth liner, <laughs> basically guys on the team, so it was a boring game. But yeah. um, fun to go see, and it was freezing <laughs> cold. <laughs> Not in the arena, but getting yeah. there. Uh, Worcester's a place that it's, it's cold, yeah. but it's windy. The wind whips through, and it was like... I think it was possibly a negative with the wind chills and the Jeez. negative. It, was, it just rips through you and you just stink. Oh, it's awful. Yeah. So I'm glad that they're now in San Jose. It's much easier to go see, obviously. <laughs> and um, again, that may be a selling point for uh, Eric Carlson to right. come and sign to with stay us. stay here. Although it did hail, right? <laughs> yeah, that's true. It did hail today. And so. it kind of stuck on the ground and looked like snow. <laughs> uh, but yeah, San Jose Jersey Collectors, he's going to give us a new jersey every week uh, to highlight on the show. So check out his Instagram page yeah. and give him a follow. And thanks for that, by the way. We really do appreciate you yeah. helping us keep this uh, fresh and, and lively back here. So. Right. Very good. You want to plug the merch? Uh, sure. Kay. Here's our store, uh, finfactor.com. Yeah. And we have gray, black. <laughs> I should know this by teal. now. <laughs> gray, black, teal shirts, unisex, yeah. and then a women's deep V black shirt. Mm-hmm. And we have hats and stickers. And anything that you guys buy helps us produce the show. So we really appreciate it. And it helps you look super fly. Right. And <laughs> we've got people buying stuff. So right. I want you to take pictures of yeah. it. Uh, so we want to see the Fin Factor out in the wild. And we'll highlight it in the show. I know someone uh, also bought stickers recently, not just the shirts and the hats. Right. Somebody bought stickers recently, and I think they said they were going to put on their laptop or something. So please oh, yeah. take a picture of your laptop and send it to us. We want to make like, a little collage of everybody with all of our swag. So uh, very good. That's uh, That does it then, doesn't it? That's it. That's the end of episode 40. 40. 40, man. My goodness, it's been a long journey. Glad to be on it with you guys, though. Hey, uh, thank you guys so much for tuning in. We really do appreciate it, and we will see you next week. Next week. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks for tuning in. If you like this episode, check out our other content, especially interviews. You can interact with us directly through social media at The Fin Factor and on Instagram at Fin Factor. And don't forget to join our live streams on YouTube. Visit our website at thefinfactor.com, where you'll find all of our episodes as videos or podcasts. You'll also find our exclusive merchandise to help support our show.